welcome to Two Girls in a Pod. I'm Sharon. I'm Christy. We want to start by thanking people for submitting questions to us. So we're really excited. And we ended up taking last week off because we wanted to give people more time to think about, you know, what questions they might want to ask. Once again, just so grateful for the people who did uh, ask some questions. So I guess we're going to get started. We're just going to do them as they come in. So first question is from Lacey. How do families open up uh, dialogues or conversations about letting kids let parents know when they need a reset? So, you know, one of the things is, is I often work with uh, family systems because sometimes kids need the reset, but they need a reset from the parent. So it might be the parents emotional about something and the kid or the kid can't verbalize or whatever. So I always tell them, do that in a time when there's not conflict going on and saying, hey, look, we're going to talk about how, you know, if we're getting overstimulated or whatever that is, is what are some things that we can use? What words or hand signals or something like that, if it's too much for me and I need to stop. And I've used this with a few of my families. And one of the things is, is the parent has to be receptive to it too. They have to be receptive to the fact that the child is not bossing them around. They have to be receptive to the fact that the child is just needing a minute because when they don't get that minute, that conflict continues and it doesn't have the kind of resolution that you would probably want. In fact, it probably escalates. (laughs) Yes. And it's very empowering when if you're having a situation where stuff is not working for you or if you're and oftentimes kids get to where they can't really talk, they get too much emotion and then they say the wrong thing, or then they get in trouble for not talking. I mean, it can be a lot of things that go on. So one of the things I say, I tell parents is sit down and talk with your kids. Let them know, say, you know what, if I'm getting, if I'm talking too loud, or if I'm yelling, and, and the kid really has a thing with yelling, something you can tell me, work on it as a family. Is it a hand signal? Is it a word that kind of says to the person, oh, okay, wait a minute. I've crossed the line or they can't speak now or whatever it is. Use that, whatever that is, and then pause. Leave it alone for a while. Do that reset, but set a time for it too. It's not like you say, oh, I need a reset. And then, you know, three hours later, the person's not back. Set a reset with anywhere from five minutes to five to seven minutes, something like that. Then come back. And if you still can't talk about it, then you say, can we put this on hold? It is important, whatever that is, and come back to it later. Because when you think about it, even adults need to do that sometimes with situations. But you figure even with a child, they don't even have all the reasoning that you do to be able to overcome something or deal with something in that moment. So I don't think it's out of the question to think that that a child would need that moment. And I think the thing is, too, is once again, all that does is open up communication. And when you you open up that communication to safety within the family unit, I think that that only helps to make those relationships stronger. Yeah. That's kind of my philosophy on that. So, Lacey, I hope that answers the question. (laughs) This is Brian. So he has a few questions here. And one of the things is, how do you stay motivated when you are depressed? Well, that's kind of a hard thing because when you're depressed, you really don't have a whole lot of motivation. That's one of the, you know, when we talk about the symptomology of depression, it's just kind of that thing of not be, you know, your interests aren't what they used to be. You don't have motivation. You don't have energy. And I tell people, pick one thing, one thing. Several of my clients, I'll tell them the one thing you have to do is get up and make your bed, get up and make your bed or go meditate for five minutes. Pick one thing. It may be easier to make your bed than meditate when you're in a certain frame of mind or whatever. But And it's amazing that even how making your bed can, you can feel like you've accomplished something for the day. Mm-hmm. Setting that goal alone, it's amazing what an effect that can have. So something small even can have a huge effect. And when I say small, I really do mean that. I mean, pick one small thing. Because once you can accomplish one thing, your brain goes, okay, then I can accomplish two. And then you work on accomplishing that one thing, make that your routine. And then you add the next thing in, because it is something that you have to reset and retrain your brain for. It's very hard to be motivated 
when you're in a state of depression. But once again, I tell people one thing, listen to music that's more upbeat, watch a comedy, any of those things, stuff that's going to shift that thinking, be out in nature. One small thing is where it starts. We're not talking about anything major, okay? The next one was, and these are questions his friends often ask him, how do you find your identity after a divorce? Oh my gosh, that's a big one. Cause you know, I work, I'm working on that with some clients currently and stuff like that. The thing is, is that I think oftentimes people don't realize that depending on the kind of relationship that you were involved in, you can lose a bit of your identity. Obviously, if you're getting a divorce, that's part of the reason. (laughs) And when we start to lose ourselves within those systems, there becomes a place where we feel like we have to kind of get away from it in order. We know we're lacking something, so we want something back. And if we can't find ourselves within that relationship, we're going to look for something else. We're going to try to get outside of it. But I think the first thing that you do is you sit down and you write down things that you used to like that you have stopped doing so you can remember them again. You write down things that you think, oh my God, I've never done this, but it's something I've had in the back of my mind. And then you start thinking about where you were in the aspect of where you feel like you lost that identity and think about what are the pieces that you miss the most of that identity. Because once you know that, then you can start going back to it. But people say, I don't know. I don't remember that person. Well, no, that's why I say you have to really sit down and think about it and think about it. And then realizing that it's a new start for you. And maybe even trying something new. Mm -hmm. It may become an exploration kind of thing where that, you know, that's how you find your identity. It may be a part of something you've never tried before. And I think to myself, anytime somebody's trying to find their identity or doing all, trying to expand their mind or whatever, it's such an exciting time for me. And, you know, we talk about that excitement all the time of new things that we learn and, oh my God, it's like, whoa, that is so cool or whatever that is. It's because nothing is written in stone where these things are concerned. You go, you explore. If you don't like that, you explore somewhere else. You know, you don't ever sit there and say, oh, I have to settle on this. Or settle on that when we're looking at our identity. Bring in lots of different things. Meet new people. Yeah. Do something like you said. Find something new and different to do. And then you can start gradually like that. The next, are there ways to find a quality person dating in a post-COVID society? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) The thing is, is that dating has become such a different thing. And, you know, I always always tease Christy about this. I always said, no. We are in this till the very, very end because I do not want to do the dating scene again. (laughs) Yeah. It's getting complicated. (laughs) Yeah. And there's, I mean, it sounds like so much of it is via phone, a lot of the stuff. And so it does look different, I think, than it used to. And I think the thing is, is that the way in which you find that quality person, I think, is when you're real. I think a lot of times what people do is they they put on a little bit of this false persona because they're filling the waters or whatever. And I think that that's okay, but there has to be you within that. And oftentimes when I'm talking to my clients and they're saying, oh yeah, well, I met this person. He seemed really good on paper. She seemed really good on paper. She looked at her blah, and or we talked on, you know, via Tinder, whatever the new things are. Then they meet. And it's nothing like they thought. Because when we can text or type something in that person's, it almost gives us not permission, but it's almost like permission. It's kind of like when you get on and you read those feeds and people are super negative and saying mean and hateful. It almost gives them permission because there's no accountability in a way. So it's a little bit different. And I think there's some of that too. It's just being real. I think in order to find a quality person, you have to be that quality person as well. You have to be genuine. Yes. Yeah. And particularly in post-COVID, I think that you're right, you know, because people are more leery of dating and all of those things. But I think that we have to trust in something in order to get past whether it's COVID or when you get divorced and and all of that. You have to get past some of those anxieties and fears in order to still continue to lead your life, if that makes sense. Yeah. How do you keep the flame burning after 10 years of marriage? 
Honey, why don't you take this one? (laughs) (laughs) What do you think? We stay interested in what each other's interests are. I feel like we have a lot of conversations. You know, you have a lot of interest in space exploration and all of those kinds of things. And I find that fascinating. And I'm, well, we're both still about like advancements in technology and things like that. So I think sharing those kinds of things keeps things interesting and exciting. And, you know, one of the other things is, is that we spend a lot of time together. Some of our friends freak out about that, that we're around each other so much. But the truth is, is when I said that, and I meant that when I married my best friend, and, and we really are best friends, and I think that's what it is. We can talk about anything, important stuff or really stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah, we like to laugh together. And I think that's a really important key thing in keeping the flame burning is having that sense of humor with one another. Yes. And learning to laugh at yourself too. Yes. And realizing that, you know, that it's okay. And that there's a contribution by both people. If your flame's not burning, I always tell people, ask yourself, what are you doing to help start the the flame Fan the flame a little bit there? Because sometimes it's just taking that time. It's putting aside the electronics. It's actually sitting talking, going, you know, the weather's turning nicer. We're so ready for it. Going outside, sitting outside, just having a cup of coffee or wine or whatever everybody's drinking and just enjoying the moment. And when speaking, being in the moment, because you and I, we're not big electronic people. And we always take time in the morning is our, is, well, morning's one of our favorite times too, because we actually sit and have conversation over coffee, not just about our day, but we talk about our plans. We talk about anything that is going on. You know, if you read an interesting article or on and on and on. Plans, goals, interests. Yeah, we have a lot of conversation over coffee in the morning and just enjoy that time. And I think that's what it is. You have to prioritize taking that time with one another to share those thoughts and ideas. That's a huge thing. And I think part of the thing that we forget to do when we're in relationships, whether it's marriage, parent, child, whatever it is, we forget to help those people to feel significant, let them know the importance that they have in our lives. So that is huge. Gratitude plays a huge role in it. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, you have gratitude that that other person is there for you to have those conversations with, and you start to feel it on that level that you, it becomes such an important part of your day when you are setting aside that time to do that. And having gratitude for that, I feel like it just, it fills you up. Absolutely. And, you know, once again, I think it's that communication. It's it's sharing those things and, and making the other person feel, know the value that they have in your life. It's, I think it's huge. It's a huge contribution when you feel heard by the yes. other person. Yeah. And his last question is, how do you motivate your spouse to want more for themselves? Sometimes it's through example. Sometimes it's meeting them where they're at. And sometimes if they're not at that place, once again, one small thing, do one small thing with them. And it might be something like, you know what, let's go walk the dog together. Or let's go play outside with the kids. It doesn't have to be anything big because sometimes people get overwhelmed when they feel like there's too much or or they feel their perception becomes, well, they want me to do all this, this, and this. And in essence, all you're saying is just do one thing. And I think that's the biggest thing. And motivating them is reminding them, you know, you've got this. Encouraging words can be really important. Well, and reminding them that they're not alone in this journey, that you're there to be supportive in any way that you can. And That has to be helpful. Absolutely. And so it's just little things. And when I say that, it's like, once again, those encouraging words, letting them, how do you help them know that they matter? And in the mattering, it's, you know, just one thing. Even once again, even to motivate, sometimes it's just getting them to start talking about the things that matter. Once you start talking about it, you bring it into awareness, then you can change something. And it can be, yeah, like you said, something even really small. It's like when you come and say, clean the bathroom sink or whatever like that. And I make note of that to you at some point. 
It's a small thing, but thank you for doing that. Even just that little tiny thing, I feel like is a motivating thing. Because you have to understand if in your head, you're thinking, well, my spouse should be cleaning the house. And if for whatever reason, they're not at that headspace or whatever, and you come in and you notice that they didn't do the dishes, but you don't notice that they cleaned the living room and your focus is on the dishes. Well, geez, you didn't get the dishes done today. What were you doing? Notice what they've done. That will help motivate them to do more. But if I come in and I'm griping to you because you didn't do the dishes, but you've done the laundry and that, instead come and say, oh, I see the laundry's done or thanks for that or I appreciate that or I'm grateful that you do the laundry. Whatever that is, those kind of things. Helps them to know that whatever the small things they are doing is showing is valuable. If they feel valuable, that will motivate them to start more. Every Baby steps for everything. You know, I always say baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So just keep that in mind. Once again, communication, communication, communication. I cannot tell that enough, the importance of what that is and how we communicate. Because when we listen and speak with intention, that means that I am invested. And that investment is super huge. Next up is Sandra. Oh, I love this one. <laughs> what are some things we can do to improve our lives that doesn't take a lot of work to do? <laughs> uh, it depends on what you're trying to improve. You know, are you talking about your physical health? Are you talking about your mental health, your spiritual health? You know, I think that the thing that's most important, though, in all of these things is to truly take more time to be mindful. Because being mindful doesn't take a whole lot of time. But when we're mindful, it helps us to know what it is we're working on. It helps us to know what we want to change. And if I'm mindful of it, I can change it if I have an awareness to it. And once again, like Brian's questions, baby steps. To make a change and to make it really stick, most people do not do a giant step forward because that is so much harder for a person to sustain. But if they do it in increments, they're much more likely to be able to change something. So Sandra, it's pick one little thing. If it's you're trying to change diet, you know, I tell people, one of my clients I worked with, she drank a lot of soda, lots of soda. I said, just start with that. I said, don't drink all the soda. Don't give it up. Just change it. Instead of having three sodas a day, have two sodas a day, then have one soda a day. Then do you see what I mean? We do it in steps because as soon as people feel like they have to give up something, oh no, they dig their heels in. And what do we say? You're not giving it up. You're going to replace it with something else. And there are things that you can do, healthy habits that you can create in that way, but it does have to happen in small increments. So once again, pick something small, depending on what you want to improve one small thing, and then work and work and work on that. Get master that, then go to the next. Yeah, it's once you master that, then you can implement something else. Yeah, absolutely. When listening to your death and dying podcast, you mentioned celebrating a person when they have passed on, and some people make it about being a sad event culture and whatnot. My question is, how does one shift their sad thoughts to happy, grateful thoughts, not only about the people that have passed on, but the ones that are left behind? You know, that's a really good question because I think it's important to realize when talking about that, we're not talking about not having the grief and loss process, okay? The grief and loss process is going to be there. So we're going to morph between sadness and that. But it's like, you know, when you're having that sad moment, oftentimes I think what happens is there's a sense of guilt. Mm -hmm. And this guilt comes from, and we talked about this, and you talked about this after your dad passed you. That was really a great way you put it. About feeling guilty when I did have those moments where I felt like happy happy or normal or whatever. And they may have been even fleeting, but I would go right back to, I felt like I had to retreat back into that mode of, that grief mode. Like, how was I having that moment when this significant person wasn't there and it's like I forgot to miss them for a moment and I felt guilty in that. 
But I realized over time that it's not taking away from in any way. The healing process is not taking away from the missing of that person. It does not diminish the relevance of the relationship. Right. And I think that's a thing that's huge because I often hear that. Understand, it is not taking away the relevance of that person. Because when we actually switch that, to me, sometimes I think us focusing so much on the death takes away more of the relevance of the person because now the relevance has become the death and not the life the person lived. And I think that's what it is, reminding ourselves, yes, those people are going to be relevant for us. And even the people that are left behind, the relevance of that, so we hold space for them. We let them know, but at the same time, we talk about those positive things or those those things that matter to us about that person who is no longer with us. We remember the significance. When you get to talk and share with others the moments that you had with those people and the significance of them to you, I feel like that that is a way to move beyond the hurting piece and give focus to the life and to share in those memories, especially those those happy times that you had with them. I feel like that's how you can shift. I mean, I can, I have memories of my dad where, you know, I just, you know, I can sit there and laugh and I am so grateful for those moments because it elevates my spirits around him, you know. But doesn't it also even just make you feel like their presence is so much closer than, you know, I know for me, if I start thinking of some of the stuff, conversations with my parents or things like that or, or, or I was thinking about my elder, my oldest brother, something that he would do. And, and it's almost like it brings them right to right in front of you. And it, it's so much more different than when I think about the end of their life. The end of their life, it almost is like there's a distance. Yeah. So it's, it's very strange. But it's, and I hope that answered the question. It's, it's one of those things we hold space for others. And even when you're sad, you know, part of us still living that are sad because of their health issues, aging. We hold space for people. We understand where they're at. We support them where they're at. But we also remind them that regardless of all the things going on, we're still here. We're still responsible for writing our narrative of our story and our life. You know, so. And sometimes it has to come with acceptance of where those people are in in dealing with their health issues and things like that, too. I think, you know, I feel like I've had to learn that. You know, my mom struggles with a lot of health issues. And there is concern for her. I feel like that she... Uh, like she does what? I feel like that there are, you know, f- there's focus that she could give to help improve her own situation. And I, that is a struggle to deal with. But I have to also remember, you know, she is who she is. And, and she's going to either take the help and advice from people that can help her or she's not. So there are... We have to remember that those people have a responsibility to their situation as well and accept that. And I think that's the biggest thing is it's their life and they get to live it. Yes. You know, and even though we have sadness and stuff around it, it's still not ours. Right. But encouraging what we can, holding space where we can. And those things I think are relevant to all of those relationships. What is both of our favorite thing to do when we're not working? Oh, my goodness. We love travel. <laughs> yes, we absolutely love travel. And we absolutely love sitting in our hot tub. <laughs> uh, but And exploring. And, yes. Even exploring. just, you know, one of the things we really like is also, you know, when our friends here will, they might pick a new place to go have lunch, something, and it's kind of supporting our local industries and stuff like that. And that is definitely one of my favorite things to do. I feel like that in any way that we can promote others in their endeavors to be successful. I love being a part of that. You know, we've talked about in past episodes where that, you know, our friend who's a rap artist, Brandon does amazing and being supportive and going to his shows and things like that. That's some of our most favorite things to do is take our friends to, to things like that and, and just be supportive. Absolutely. And we both love to read. So reading's a big thing. Uh, we love a lot of stuff that expands our mind. 
we love our home really is our sanctuary and and we really love that and we we love being around people that we love and care about yes you know so oh where's our next vacation you know we don't know <laughs> we're working on it we're working on it yeah um we'll let everybody know when we know this is her her dog is daisy why is daisy so naughty uh laugh out loud well we know why daisy's naughty sandra it's because you spoil daisy yes Daisy bosses you around and hmm. she shows those big eyes and then you give in. Yes. But you know what is really cool is that our four-legged fur babies are so amazing and they bring such joy. And I say, you know, if you have them, spoil the heck out of them, yeah. really, because they give so much back. You know, we, we, so we talk about that with our little fur baby, Misha, you know, we were so grateful to have her for almost 13 years and just... Yeah, some she people, bossed us. Some people may call it spoil. I just call it love. <laughs> so our friend said we spoiled her extreme, but you know. And favorite newspapers to read? That's kind of hard for me because I just read whatever you know when I'm scrolling, and it can be the New York Times, it can be the Washington Post, it can be just anything. Um, I don't know if I have necessarily a favorite newspaper, but I do read a lot of articles from a uh, fast company. That's a magazine, and I I really enjoy the articles in that. So more magazines, I guess, for us. Of course, I do a lot of psychology today and stuff like that, and I try to keep up on you know new stuff going on in the mental health, with mental health and things that are effective and stuff like that. So the next one is from Kathy G. Have you ever felt like you weren't able to give your best effort? If so, how did you cope with the thoughts and feelings of not being enough? I feel like everybody has that moment where we feel like our best is not enough. And I think the thing is, is when I think that is more of the fact that if we do believe we're doing our best, then it is already enough. But when we think our bet, somebody else doesn't feel we're doing our best or we're putting that pressure on ourselves, then I think is when we, that starts to have such, that can have such a negative impact on us and can feel heavy. There can be a heaviness about that. And I think in particularly as therapist and Kathy G is a therapist, uh, I think as therapist, I think we all want to do the best that we possibly can. And I, and I know in my career, I, I felt like I've fallen short of that with some clients and, and it can be really this heavy feeling. But then I have to step away and have to realize that I'm only there for a brief time in these people's, in my clients' lives. And and I know, Kathy, she really puts so much into the work that she does and is an exceptional therapist. But, and I think that sometimes makes it hard when you put so much in. Well, I think that you guys do put a lot of pressure on yourselves, which I can understand why. I mean, you know, people are looking to you for direction and that. I think what's really important for a mental health therapist to remember is sometimes you need to take a mental health day for yourself. And maybe you feel like that you're not able to give your best effort because you get to that place where you're in that burnout stage. And that does happen. I mean, and I feel like it's completely normal for that to happen. I mean, you're hearing a lot every day. So, you know, keeping your mental health a priority as well. And sometimes you do have to take that moment to just let your mind rest. And, you know, when you say, how did I cope with when I have those thoughts of not being enough? You know, one of the things is I'm very grateful because I have you to talk to. You know, I'll talk with Christy and, you know, I'll say, you know, well, maybe I could have should have done this or, you know, this or that. And, you know, one of the things is, is talk to your support because sometimes we're so close to the situation. We don't know what we're really doing in the situation. And you guys have something called peer supervision. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a really important thing that you guys do because it, it does give you that opportunity to present the the situation and bounce ideas off one another and help each other out. And I feel like if I'm at a place where I can, I feel that I'm not able to give my best effort, then if I'm starting to feel that I know I need to take that step back and I'm going to go talk with somebody. And even if it's you or it's Kathy or Kathy or Sylvia or Heather, that's my group of support as far as my business goes 
you know, if it's my personal life, I have my, well, these are my friends too. So they have to do both roles, but our family and friends, that support system, I think is huge. Yeah. Using that support system, getting feedback from them, understanding, and then reminding ourselves that sometimes we're being too hard on ourselves. We're being too hard on ourselves and that it's okay when we do get to that place where it is overwhelming us and stuff, being okay with saying, I'm overwhelmed. I need a moment. Take that moment, reset, rejuvenate, do what you have to. It's not our next trip, but we will be doing uh, Antelope Canyon. This has been something we've really wanted to do. So we're very excited because we're going to do that with uh, Kathy G and Heather. And that's a reset for us. I know it will be very much so because it's where we'll do a little bit of, we're going to do some work there because we're therapists and that's what we do, but it's going to be the beauty of it and just really being present with all of that. So take time for you, use your support systems and stop being so hard on yourself. Yeah. Because people, we do that all the time. We will beat ourselves up and we don't need to. We do the best that we can in those moments and that's all we can do. The outcome or whatever happens after that, sometimes that's other people who have to do that. We don't get to do it for them. Next is Maggie. Dealing with empty nest and parenting adult children. I know, you know, I keep hearing this, that, you know, you never get to stop parenting children. <laughs> 30 years old and you're still parenting them. Empty nest, you know, it's really interesting. It's, it's a difficult thing for people. This is what I think is hard for people who maybe don't have kids or whatever. And I remember with uh, my parents, you know, it's like, ah, oh, my dad had more empty nests than my mom did. And they had a long time with that. Because remember, they have 11 children. But, you know, that last one left and you talk about, and it was my dad who really did. He's calling everybody all the time. <laughs> He's, it was hard. Because the thing is, is when you're a parent, from the time they're born, and particularly till the time they graduate from high school, we're using that time period you're a parent so much. That is really your full-time job. I don't care what other job you have. That job, you get to stop at five o'clock or whatever. Parenting is your identity. It's your full-time job. And then when you don't have it, it's almost like you feel like you lose a piece of you. And then it's like, now what do I do? That's when I tell people, it's time to get excited because it's time to really do more introspection who am I other than a parent? Who am I other than that job or whatever? Who am I? How do I start my new narrative, start my new beginning? Well, and I think, too, realizing, you know, she said about parenting an adult child, realizing that the relationship changes, but it morphs, it can morph in a really good way because, you know, you, you've set them up and gave them a foundation and you know now you get to reap the benefits of the friendship that you can have as an adult child and i think that's the interesting thing when you said that is because when your child becomes an adult you're the parent but you're no longer have parental rights so to speak <laughs> i'm an adult you can't tell me what to do and they're right but the thing is is that it's now looking at your child more as a peer but it's hard for them to also understand and remember that you still have more life knowledge than they do. Mm -hmm. As an adult parent, you throw out your little words of wisdom and plant your little seeds and then you just walk away and let them do what they're going to do. Yeah, and you kind of just have to accept that. And I, mm -hmm. mean, I don't know what that was like for my parents because they didn't really have to go through the emptiness thing, I guess, because when I was 19, they adopted my brother who was only 18 months old at the time. So they started over. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, so I think that's the big thing is redefining who you are because you're no longer, you're a parent, but you're not, you're, the role has shifted. Dealing with retiring spouses and individual interest. Oh, yeah. And it, it's funny when spouses retire, you know, our friends who have their military husbands retire, you know, it's like, okay, now what are we going to do? Now what are we going to do? What are we going to do now? <laughs> they're, they're like, go do something minus me because they don't know what to do. We don't know what to do with our time and stuff. So that becomes a thing. Most You've had a routine all of this time. Now it's changing. This person's home. 
how does that look different? So yeah, I mean, definitely time to have some conversations. <laughs> the biggest thing, communicate. Yeah. What is it you're expecting of me? Oh, you want me to be with you 24 seven? Well, that's not going to happen. So what else are you expecting? But really having those conversations. Once again, those individual interests. If you have an interest, share that interest with your spouse. If it's not one of those things or have your friend group that you go and do those things with. Absolutely. Explore something together. Maybe you guys have never done, but you both want to try. But you don't know unless you have those conversations to find out what those things are. And if you want to keep your individual interest, then you say, hey, you know, and I have some clients who they go and do game, the women go to game night, the guys go and do pool or poker. Do that. Be okay with it. And know it's okay to have individual interest and go do things. And it's okay to do those interests together. Okay. So thank you very much for that. Uh, this is Rebecca's 3 a.m. thoughts. I think we got blamed for something here. Mm -hmm. How to find the right therapist for you. You know what's really interesting is a therapeutic relationship is really important. And I always tell people, if you go to a therapist, it doesn't feel right. Go find one that's going to work with you. Because if you stick with the therapist that you do not click with, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. And I tell people when they come into my office, if we're working and you just think, you know, I suck or this ain't working, it ain't clicking, I don't like your haircut, I don't care what it is, I tell them. You're sleeping through my session. sessions. I don't care. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. But my thing is, as I tell them, because this is about you, I will help you find a therapist that is about you because this is not about my ego. Okay. So if you don't click with them and you'll know when you see them, ask about their therapeutic things if that's what you want. You might ask, you know, well, have you treated this a lot? You get a little bit of background, whatever it is that you need that you feel comfortable with. Yeah, that's the questions that I feel like that you need to ask is to find out what their experience is with and especially if it has anything to do with what you're dealing with. You know, I have some clients who they'll flat out ask me, are you LBGTQ affirming? GTQ plus affirming and if I wasn't then they don't want to have it with me there might be some who if maybe they say well are you Wiccan or whatever or do you understand I don't whatever it doesn't matter you're coming to me it is about you it is not about me so remembering that when you're doing things with therapist see how it fits with you okay and of course, we do live by military post, so they must be doing maneuvers because I hear the helicopters. Was you, were you going to add anything to that? No. Over the roar of the helicopter flying over. Ways to calm yourself or your voices techniques, meditation, mindfulness. You need to slow them down. Sometimes music can do that. Really simple things, maybe going for a walk and really going for a walk, but then making sure that you're focusing on either the steps you're taking, your breath, or the scenery around you. Mm -hmm. So that kind of slows everything down. Yeah, I mean, the question that she poses has several examples about managing, say, even road rage or fears. And I really feel like that all of that comes down to slowing down the mind. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to take your your mind out of the space that it's in shift it to something else for a moment and become so focused on that that it slows down your mind and you're able to process things better then you find a sense of calm or peace that to deal with issues well and i think too when you are looking at and you know daily anxieties and stuff like that you have to remember and i think this is super important people have to remember when you're having these thoughts you start to feed them. What you feed will grow. Yes. So shifting that thought by doing something mindful, whether it's drawing, listening to me, once again, you're shifting the mind out of that thought process. That helps to decrease whether it's anxiety, road rage. When we do it now, I remember this interview and uh, it was like, one of the things is, is if when we have road rage and it's so little now, so, so little, Christy's gotten much better. <laughs> <laughs> I did used to suffer from that. And now I really don't. It's like, it happens. 
I know to expect it because people out of the road, they do crazy things. I see it and I anticipate it and move on. And if we say, oh, you, that was so stupid, you stupid person, then we fail, follow it with, I wish you a good life. <laughs> okay, I haven't got to that point, but you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you a good life. Be on your way. But yeah, those are the things. Really shifting and shutting down that and not feeding it, feeding something else, okay? What labs do you have done or asked for when trying to talk to your doctor about home hormonal imbalances? I always tell people, go in and really, if that's what you feel is going on with you, ask them to run the panels. It, it doesn't take that. It's not that big. It's a blood test, and it just measures. And sometimes, you know, you'll feel different things going on in your body, and if you've had other things done and it's not that sometimes I tell people and and sometimes with my clients I can tell if it's hormonal and I'll tell them the reason this med's not working it's because there's certain little things that aren't changing with medication or stuff I know that shift is something else so I might say you know we need to look at hormones or we need to look at something out autoimmune whatever that is and so I help them to have a dialogue with their doctors about what we're doing or that if you've had some stuff done and you feel it might be hormonal Go and ask for the test. Say, I'm, you know, I don't know if something's up with my hormones. I just had one of my clients do that and found out it's her testosterone is too low. So we knew something was off. If you feel something's off, use your voice. Go ask people. And I think that, that it, what's really good is that when you're working with a therapist and a doctor, you kind of can have those conversations with both and be able to to maybe find a solution that might have been outside of, you know, what you were thinking to begin with. And if you don't have a therapist, be your strongest advocate. Yeah. Tell them this is what I want. I want a baseline so I know what's going on. And if you rule that out, then let's go on to something else. Have a voice with your doctor for sure. And if you feel like that doctor's not listening, not hearing you, then maybe it's time to look for a different provider. Uh, <laughs> things you have found toxic in medical doctors, not listening not listening that's biggest yeah. thing right there not listening nothing else compares to that not listening things i've learned to listen to over the years is conceptualize and look at a bigger picture i don't focus on a little piece of something i look at the bigger piece because the bigger piece gives more information don't stay so focused and stay narrow to a topic or whatever I have to conceptualize. So I tell people, make it bigger, okay? And the more information you have, the more helpful that is. And that's when you've known to refer someone to a, a, doc a medical doctor because you're able to see, you're not just looking at one behavior, you're seeing the whole picture. Yeah, and I listen to little things. I, I'm really good, I hear little messages and I really watch. How do I not blame myself for holding a boundary? Oh my God, that is a big one. Maybe we should have started with that one. But seriously, the thing is, is we feel guilt because of how somebody else perceives our boundary. People get mad at our boundaries. And when people are getting mad at our boundaries, that's when we know we need a boundary. And people don't like boundaries. And that is okay. The boundary is for you, not for the other person. And because it's not for the other person, you cannot take on some how somebody else re reacts and responds to what you're doing. So, and you know, is she in the follow-up is thinking about family guilt when you need to enforce distance from your close family. That is a boundary, and that sometimes is a hard thing. But once again, you have to realize that at the end of the day, you're with you 24-7. You are not with somebody else 24-7. And because of that, you have to be happy in your own skin. And setting boundaries is imperative setting boundaries is not being selfish setting boundaries is self-preservation it's self-care there's a lot of self in there but selfish is not one of them mm -hmm. so remembering when you set that boundary if somebody's not happy with it and they say well they don't like whatever you know what i i'm sorry you feel that way but this is about, this is to take care of me or whatever you have to in that thing. And sometimes you have to have to set those boundaries, okay? When sometimes with that, when you are getting stronger and stuff like that, sometimes you do have to let people go because they do not match up with where you're, where you're at on your journey and stuff, okay? 
and it can be a hard thing, but hopefully people are respectful of that, and hopefully people understand that piece of it. And and sometimes it can be a sad thing because you will find that there will be some people in your life that will, you'll have to put that distance between you and them, but it's because you are growing as an individual and in order for you to be everything that you you can be or should be to be happy like you said comfortable in your own skin and those things there's nothing wrong with that and realizing not everybody that is currently in your circle may fit into that and it's okay because you will make the friends that are important that will help you in your growth You'll gravitate the, you'll to those, those people friendships. yes that will help you as a person to grow and sometimes after if you have to step away for a minute from that family system and they see your growth and and they see you're okay sometimes they end up coming around anyway because they like they like what they see but it's a process and sometimes those processes they're growing pains and sometimes they can hurt a little bit okay yeah, but I some, tell people, keep doing it. Yes, because some people aren't, you know, in that place that they're ready to change, but you are. And as you set that example and they see that growth in you, yeah, sometimes they will come back. So just realize that even if you have to put some distance in between you and those negative people for a time, it may morph into something wonderful and that relationship may change and, and blossom in a way you didn't even expect. And then our final question is, uh, Melody and uh, Rebecca, what books to read? So we're going to just give you a couple, a few books that we've read and we really like. The first one is The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. It's just a really good one. It's about mind changing your mindset and stuff like that. So that's really good. The next one is A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. That is kind of an, it's empowering. Uh, it's it's about identifying changes in the changes not only in other people but in ourselves um and the power of now by Eckhart Tolle and with both of those books I really feel like there's you know a very spiritual side to it yes so it's going to be a very introspective kind of read both of those and along with the 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 kind of spiritual one is one by Joan Chittister essential writings, writings. she's a, a catholic nun but it's such a different spin on spirituality and the relationships and and growth yeah and, and and being a female and that growth in that as well so that was really a good one as well the greatest secret that's another one by Rhonda Byrne and that series definitely is just a great series I feel like in self-help and just in the expansion of gratitude yeah and the value of it and why it's important you are a badass it's the first one in the series it's by Jen Sincero. Sincero, yes. It's just a it's a fun book, but it's her journey and it, it it's really just a neat way of putting things. It's about letting go of yes. you know some beliefs that maybe were not your own and you don't even realize it. Um Stillness Speaks by Eckhart Tolle. I that one is another one that's more of a spiritual, but I feel like that book helped me. It just resonated with me so much. Absolutely. And the last two the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's just, you know, when you when you read those four agreements and you can implement them in all aspects of your life, it's very empowering. It really, really is. It's just a great book. It's not a very long book, but it's great. And the final one is a little different, but it's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And the reason that is it's it talks about the power of a message and how you implement that message and then how you can overcome that message. It's a fantastic book. Really loved it. I've read it. It's now on Christie's reading list. And it's just very powerful. And Maya Angelou was very powerful and, and the things that she learned. And once again, those messages and how do we change it? And I really feel like all of these are about rewiring the brain to yes. think differently and help you have a more positive outlook. Yes. You know what? And we want to say that we have such gratitude for this podcast. We have gratitude for the people who submitted questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And we look forward to next week. We hope that you enjoyed the podcast. As always, we ask for feedback. And if we didn't answer the question correctly, then you hit us up and we will try to do our best. Okay. 
Thank you so much. And we hope that you guys have a fantastic week. Bye. Bye.